Genesis 50, verses 15 to 26. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a, mo a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. Now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you. You shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. And they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. And let's pray again together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the book of Genesis. Lord, we praise you for all that it shows, you, shows us about not only your creation, but Lord, the way that you are sustaining your creation. Lord, the way that, that sin has entered the world, but the way that you have provided provision. Lord, for even as death came through one man and death came to all men because man sinned, Lord, through Jesus Christ, the federal head of our salvation, we have received life. Lord, we praise you that this, this thread, this theme of your faithfulness to your promises is so clear all the way through the book of Genesis as you enter into covenant with your people, these covenants that, that point ahead to the new covenant in Christ's blood. Lord, we thank you for all that you've taught us about who you are and who we are before you. And we pray, Lord, that as we close this book of Genesis, that, that the truths that we have learned would never be far from our minds, but, Lord, that we would continue to look to you, the faithful, covenant-keeping God. And, Lord, that, that we would be continually transformed by preaching these truths to ourselves every day. Lord, as we remember the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is, who is so clearly pointed to through this book, and Lord, I pray that you would help us to look ahead to the, the great deliverance. Lord, not just the deliverance to a physical country, but Lord, to a heavenly country. As we pray, Lord, for your kingdom to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it has been said that all good things must come to an end. But as Christians, we know that that is not the case. As Christians, we know that, in fact, the exact opposite is true. That all that is truly good is eternal. And the same can be said of Genesis. Here we are at the end of the Toledot of Jacob. But we're also at the end of Genesis. And as is always the case when we finish a book of the Bible, I'm, I'm sad to see it end. We've learned so much about the Lord and about his, his dealings with his people that it, it leaves me feeling wistful, a little bit, a little bit sad that, that, that this is the end of, of Genesis. This is the end of our, our studies in Genesis. But the end of Genesis isn't really the end. 
It's only the end of the beginning. All that is truly good in Genesis is eternal. The, the truths that we have learned about God and about his dealings, not just with Israel, but with us, with his covenant people, will endure forever and ever. So here at the end of Genesis, we have sort of a, a tying up of loose ends as, as Moses highlights important themes that are going to continue through Exodus, through the Old Testament, and into the New. Themes of, of repentance, themes of forgiveness, themes of sovereignty and hope. In, in fact, the hope for the future is grounded in repentance, in forgiveness, and in sovereignty. And that's just as, as true today in the, the lives of God's people as it was then. So in this passage, in the, the second half of Genesis chapter 50, Joseph's brothers finally repent. And Joseph then will demonstrate his forgiveness. And, and through this, God is revealed as sovereign over all. And God is also revealed as the one in whom his people must set their hope. And so this passage reveals that, that Israel can trust God. And even, even in the course of being sinned against, and even when they sin themselves, for God is using all things for their good. We learn, too, that we can trust God, even when others sin against us, even when we sin, that God is indeed using all things for our good and for his glory. So in this passage, we see Joseph's brother's repentance in verses 15 to 18. And then Joseph's forgiveness in verses 19 to 21. And then Joseph's hope in verses 22 to 26. So first of all, Joseph's brother's repentance in verses 15 to 18. Here after the death of Jacob, Joseph's brothers are afraid. And so they say in verse 15, it may, they, they say it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Joseph's brothers had hated Joseph, and now they are afraid that he is going to hate them. A guilty conscience often produces fear. Proverbs 28.1 speaks of this kind of response to guilt. The wicked flee when no one pursues. The wicked flee when, when no one pursues. Someone who is, is living under the weight of a guilty conscience is feeling persecuted, as it were, by, by their conscience, fears that, that everybody around them is persecuting them. And so the people that are, again, there's other roots of, of fear, but, but quite often if you're fearful of, of other people and continually worried that people are trying to do bad things to you, it can point to a fact that you have a guilty conscience. Well, now that their father is dead, Joseph's brothers are waiting for the hammer to fall. And this often happens even in our day where, where families will, will force themselves to get along until a parent dies. But then after the funeral, sometimes even at the funeral, the gloves are off. But Joseph hadn't given his brothers any cause to think that he was coming after them. On the contrary, he has been most gracious with them. And notice, though, that this is the first time that Joseph's brothers acknowledge that they've done wrong. A apart from a few impotent comments by Reuben, Joseph's brothers don't make any mention of selling him into slavery. And now, as they, they finally acknowledge it, they, they don't mince words. They call their behavior for what it is. Evil. They call it evil. And, and in this, this this, the response here it looks like true repentance. It looks like true repentance. It's a confession. It's, it's calling sin for what it is. But at this point, they still can't see past their guilty fear. So they send a message to Joseph. Now, sometimes a, a letter is a good way to reach out to someone that you have wronged. And I, I'm not talking about an email and never through a text but an actual physical letter. I, I've used that in my own life, in fact, with my own brother, where, where I wrote to him to ask his forgiveness. And, and praise God, to, to, he, he granted it. 
But Joseph's brothers send Joseph a message saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the tr transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. N now there is no record of Jacob ever having said anything like this. This is probably a fabrication. But by invoking their father's name, they're saying that it was, it was his command that Joseph would forgive them. They hope that Joseph is going to have mercy on them. And so Jacob, in a sense, though dead, still speaks. But again, look at the words that are used to describe their behavior. Transgression, sin, evil. Three words that, that strongly communicate the wickedness of their actions. It's interesting, if you look for a synonym for the word wicked in Microsoft Word, 10 words come up, but eight of them are positive. Words like, like good, words like, like cool come up, but, but, not, but not, not evil. There's a wrong understanding as there are, are called, I think it's the de-evolution of language as, as words have ceased to, to have a, a clear meaning as to what they, they really mean. But these men knew what wickedness was. And these men knew that they were. But it's not enough just to acknowledge your wickedness. You, you need to ask for forgiveness and that's what they do. Now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Notice here that they're not just invoking the name of their father, they're invoking the name of God. They're saying that they are servants of the same God as Jacob. Now this is a good sign. This, this also looks like true repentance, that they're referring to themselves as God's servants and that they're asking for forgiveness with, with no excuses. So how does Joseph respond? D does he get angry? D does he berate them? No, Joseph wept. Joseph wept. Several times through this Toledo, we we've seen Joseph crying. Well, well, why is he crying this time? It's hard to say exactly, but it's most likely a combination of factors, and including the fact that after all these years, his brothers are finally asking for repentance, or for forgiveness. But I think it's, it's probably mostly due to the fact that, that after all these years of his love and his care for them, that they still don't trust him. That they think that it was only their, their father's presence that kept him from exacting vengeance upon them. Now, as we're, we're going to see later on, that Joseph had actually forgiven them a long time ago. You can see that back in, in chapter 45. But now the brothers are seeking forgiveness themselves. Now, now they're, they're, they've sent him a message and now they come to him personally. They, they fall down before him. Now earlier they had unwittingly fulfilled Joseph's dreams from chapter 37 in, in bowing down before, them, before him not knowing that he was actually Joseph. But now they know. Now they're... they're, they're conscious of the fact that, that they're fulfilling Joseph's dreams, the same dreams that had caused them to hate him in the first place. And they say to Joseph, we are your servants. Now, now the word here actually means slaves. They had sold Joseph as a slave and now they're willing to become slaves themselves. And it, it is really what they deserve. And again, this looks like true repentance, that they're, they're willing to accept the consequences of their sin. As you sit here this morning, I wonder if there's anything you need to repent of. If there's anything that, that you need to ask forgiveness from God for, that you need to go to a person that you have wronged and ask for their forgiveness. Friends, if you are carrying around a, a burden of guilt, now is the time to deal with it. Maybe even something that, that, that is from, from the distant past. You're, you're carrying it with you. Even today. That's probably that thing you're thinking about right now. This is an opportunity for you to deal with it. 
to, to make it right with God by going to Him in repentance and confession and faith. And by going to the person that you've wronged, asking, confessing their sin and a, your sin and asking for forgiveness yourself from them. You don't need to carry that burden any longer. Confess your sin. Ask forgiveness. And no matter what happens, even if, if the person who's, who's wronged you says no, be confident that you can find forgiveness at the cross of Christ. And once you have gone to Christ for forgiveness, your, your sin is as far as the east is from the west, that God has, has buried your sins in the bottom of the sea, that, that God will not remember your sins against you anymore, that, that if, if you have repented of your sin and put your faith in Christ, that that sin is gone. You have been washed whiter than snow. So you don't need to, to pick up that burden of guilt again. Because your guilt has been placed on Christ. Now in verses 19 to 21, we, we see Joseph's forgiveness. Let's look at how Joseph responds. Derek Kidner says that each sentence of Joseph's threefold reply is a pinnacle of Old Testament and New Testament faith. Notice what he says first. Do not fear. Am I in the place of God? Joseph leaves it to God to right the wrong. He knows that the one to whom his brothers ultimately need forgiveness from is God. In Luke chapter 5, the Pharisees accused Jesus of blasphemy for telling a paralyzed man that he was forgiven, saying, who can forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus replied saying, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise Pick up your bed and go home. The most important forgiveness that sinners need to seek is forgiveness from God, the taking care of the, the vertical element of our sin. Yet sinners must also seek forgiveness from those that they have wronged. Because much of the sin that we commit actually takes place in the horizontal realm. The, the, most of the sin that you commit is against other people. Yes, ultimately against God, but there's also a, a horizontal element of it that must be addressed. I remember years ago that um, I, I committed an, an act of vandalism. And back when I was, I was, was much, much younger, and, and, and I had come to saving faith, and, and I was truly regenerate, truly born again, but but that thing kept on hanging over my head. It was niggling. And I actually knew the person that, that I'd done it to, so, so I called him. Probably 20-something years after, after it had happened. And I just said, I, like, I sinned against you by, by doing this act of vandalism. Would you, would you please forgive me? And, and I would like to... I would like to pay reparation. I would like to, to do something to, to make it right. Now, this individual wasn't a believer, but, but he, he commended me. He said, wow, like that, that took guts or something to that nature. But, and he, and he, he said, look, don't worry about it. That's fine. It's done. And so this man, again, was not a Christian, but, but this was an opportunity for me to, to walk out the gospel by seeking forgiveness. And he, even as, a, as an unbeliever, granted it. So sinners do have to take care of the, the horizontal element of our sin. But too, too often, when people sin against us, we, we act as though their sin is not horizontal, but vertical. So often when people sin against us, it's, it's as though we're looking down on them from this, this position of, of holiness, as though we weren't a sinner, and we, we judge, we condemn, we, we want to be in the place of God. We act as though we are God. We want to be the judge. We want to execute the sentence. 
We forget that we too are sinners. We forget that, that we too need forgiveness. Joseph doesn't do that. He acknowledges that God is the judge. He leaves it to God. Leviticus 19.18 says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is, echo, this is echoed in Romans 12.19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You can be confident that all sin will be punished because God is a holy and a righteous judge. All sin will be punished either in Christ or in hell. Don't judge the story by the middle. If the person who has sinned against you is a Christian, you will very likely see reconciliation in this life or certainly in the next. But if they aren't, you can be confident that the punishment that they will receive is infinitely greater than anything that you could ever mete out. So pray for their repentance. Pray for reconciliation and leave it to God. Holding on to unforgiveness is essentially saying, I want to be in the place of God, but you can forgive because God is God and you're not. Now look at Joseph's second statement in verse 20. This is one of the most profound verses in the Bible. Genesis 50, 20. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. This verse communicates one of the, the clear and, and important theological themes of the Joseph narrative. And it, it also communicates one of the clear and important theological themes in the Bible. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. This is one of those verses that, that every Reformed pastor is eager to preach because it so powerfully communicates God's glory, because it so powerfully offers comfort to people when they are being mistreated. It's, it's right up there with Romans 8, 28. And, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called, by the, for those who are called according to His purpose. So Scripture teaches that God is sovereign. That, that he is in control of all things. But scripture also teaches that man is a responsible moral agent. Now these, these truths are an apparent paradox. I, again, like every major truth in scripture, our, our human minds can can't figure out how they, they fit together. But scripture teaches both, so we affirm both. Spurgeon was, was asked, how do you reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility? He says, you don't. You don't have to reconcile friends. Do you see what Spurgeon is, is saying here? Spurgeon is, is saying that, that, <clears throat> that God's sovereignty and man's responsibility work together. But we, we know from James that, that God is never the author of sin. So look again at Genesis 50:20. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And it's not that you meant it for evil and God used it for good. Joseph is saying here that, that you had a plan and God had a plan. Your plan was evil. God's plan was good. And that God's good plan trumped your evil plan. Proverbs 19.21 communicates this as well. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bible to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 in Peter's Sermon on Pentecost. I preached on this on Resurrection Sunday. Acts 2.22. 
Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Do you see that there? God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Man had a plan in the crucifixion of Jesus and it was evil. But God had a plan in the crucifixion of Jesus and it was good. It was very good. It was supremely good. And this plan that God had was not just to save lives, but to save souls. To save souls. Now, Joseph doesn't say here in chapter 50, verse 20, he doesn't say the words, I forgive you. Again, he's, he's already forgiven them. He's, he's communicated essentially the same thing back in chapter 45. Let's just, just flip back there for a moment. to Genesis chapter 45, verses uh, five, to, 5 to 8. Verse 5. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life life. And then verse 7, God sent me before you. And then verse 8, it was not you who sent me here, but God. So, so Joseph has been already preaching the sovereignty of God in this to himself. He's, he's already looking for God's hand in this evil treatment that he has received from his brothers. Joseph's brothers intended to get rid of Joseph by selling him into slavery. God intended to save many lives. Seeking to understand God's good plan and the evil that is committed against you is a massive help in enabling you to forgive those who have sinned against you. Think about, about David's response to Shimei in, in 2 Samuel 16, where, where David is fleeing Jerusalem with with his, with his men and, and uh, because of the, the rebellion, because of the coup of, of Absalom and Shimei, a relation of Saul, came out and cursed David and was throwing stones and, and clods of dirt at him. And Abishai, one of David's mighty men, said to David, let me go over there and take off his head. Now, what, what would you have done? If you're the king and you're fleeing because of the rebellion, you're saying, you can say, yeah, go for it. But no, David doesn't do that. He says, maybe the Lord will look on the wrong done to me and the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. He's saying, maybe God is behind this. Maybe God is behind this and God is going to use this, even this sin that is against me, somehow for my good. Now friends, that's faith. That's the kind of faith that will help you when others sin against you. And they will. And even if you, you don't see the good that comes, you can be confident that God is using it for your good to make you more like Christ. But you know, even if you do see the good, even if you, you are blessed to see the good that, that comes out of the sin that others have committed against you, that's only a small part of, of the good that God is doing. The good that God is doing in your life and the, the lives of, of other Christians around you. So trusting God enables you to forgive others. And the flip side of that is that if you, if you aren't able to forgive others, then you are not trusting God. All through redemption history, you, you can see that, that people plan evil against God's people and God uses it for good. Think about Moses and Pharaoh, or, or Samson and Delilah, or David and Saul, or Esther and Haman. The list goes on. As, Math, as Kenneth Matthews declares, evil succumbs to God's gracious purposes on behalf, in behalf of his creation. And as we've seen, all of that points like a thread, points like a clear line right through to the gospel of Jesus Christ, where wicked men crucified the God-man. But God used the, crucifix the crucifixion of the God-man to save our souls. 
Joseph's third statement also communicates his forgiveness. Again, even though the words aren't used. Verse 21, So do not fear, I will provide for you and for your little ones. And so Joseph assures his brothers that he's going to keep on doing for them what he's been doing all along, ever since they arrived in Egypt. He, he's going to care for them. He's going to provide for their families. He, he's, so he's provided for them. He comforts them. And, and he speaks kindly to them. He returns good for their evil. Friends, it's not, it's not enough just to refrain from exacting vengeance on those who sin against you. You have to instead actively do good for them. Romans 12, 20. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is Forgiveness, overcoming evil with good. Again, I wonder as you're sitting here this morning, is there anyone that you need to forgive? Is there anyone at all that you are withholding forgiveness from? Forgiven people forgive. Forgive out of the depths of the forgiveness that you have received in Jesus Christ. Jesus taught in the model prayer that, that if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. Because just as forgiven people are forgiving people, unforgiven people are unforgiving people. If your life is characterized by, by unforgiveness, uh, holding on to that in, against someone, then, then you really need to examine your heart to say, am I really saved? And ask the Lord to do that work in your heart, to, to grant you that forgiveness of others, to be able to, to let it go as one who has been forgiven in a measurably greater debt. Your unforgiveness will destroy you. And your unforgiveness will destroy those around you as well. Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many may, may become defiled. I admit sometimes it's hard to forgive other people. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a challenge. Sometimes it's, it's something that, that I don't want to do. Sometimes I forgive people and then... I take up an offense again, and then I've got to forgive them for the same thing again. Even though they haven't sinned against me again. And so, what I, I seek to do, I commend to you as well, to, to cry out to God. Say, to help me, Lord, to, to let go of this sin. To let go of, of whatever it is that I'm holding on to. So I can prove myself to be someone who has received forgiveness in Jesus Christ. But this message here in Genesis 50 it goes far beyond <clears throat> one man's forgiveness for his brothers. There, there is a powerful message here for Israel as well. <clears throat> Sidney Gradanus explains that because God is sovereign and faithful to his plan, Israel can entrust herself to his good care. Do you see the message that's being infirmed, inferred here? God has kept you alive. God has kept many alive. God is alive. God is on the throne. You can trust him. You can trust him no matter what happens to you. And with that, that takes us to the final verses of Genesis, the, the death of Joseph. But the death of Joseph is not the most important thing going on here. In verses 22 to 26, we see Joseph's hope. Joseph's hope. Joseph's final days are spent in Egypt. He lived to be 110. You realize that 93 of Joseph's 110 years were spent in Egypt, outside of the Promised Land. So he'd spent almost his whole life outside of, of the Promised Land in Egypt. And in Egypt, 110 was, to, was considered to be the ideal lifespan. And in the Bible, living to see one's grandchildren is described as a blessing. Psalms 128, verse 6. May you see your children's children. Proverbs 17, 6. Grandchildren are the crown of the aged. 
Well, Joseph lived to see his great-grandchildren. And we're told that he adopted Manasseh's children just as Jacob had adopted Manasseh. And so now Joseph's brothers are gathered around his deathbed. Now we don't know which of them is alive at this point. This could even refer to their sons. But now with Joseph's last words, he speaks for the first time about God's promise of land. He says, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 15, well, it really goes back before that, back to Genesis 12, but, but in Genesis 15, 13 to 15, God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. So God had promised Abraham that the promised land, the land of Canaan, and God had repeated the promise again and again and again. He'd repeated it to Abraham and then to Isaac and to Jacob. Now Joseph had not received the promise from God directly, but Joseph had faith in the same promise. Joseph had hope in the same God. Israel's home, Joseph understood, is in Canaan, not Egypt. Even though Canaan had been his dwelling place for 93 years, Canaan was, even though, sorry, Egypt had been his dwelling place for, for 93 years, it wasn't his home. Egypt wasn't his home. Canaan was his home. And likewise for the future, the home of God's people would be in the promised land. So they don't need to fear, even if they're mistreated as they would be, even if God delayed in delivering them, as he did, they could trust God. God would delay for 400 years. But Joseph had hope, and he sought to communicate that hope to his brothers, that God would visit them, that God would deliver them. And so now Joseph acts on this hope. He makes his brothers swear, based on the assurance that God is going to visit them, to carry up his bones from there, Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so Joseph is here speaking with confidence that in the future, that the descendants of his brothers are going to carry his bones out of Egypt and back to Canaan. And so by making this provision, Joseph is demonstrating his faith. Hebrews 11:22. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So the writer of Hebrews is here testifying to this faith of Joseph, this faith that, that has not seen the fulfillment of the promise. And in verse 26, so Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and they put him in a coffin in Egypt. But like for Jacob, Egypt was not Joseph's home. Joseph here is following his father's footsteps, so to speak. But where Jacob's body only waited 70 days to go back to Canaan, Joseph's would wait 440 years. And so though Genesis ends in death, the final verse of Genesis is full of expectation. It's full of hope. The book of Exodus is going to begin 400 years later under very different circumstances. There's a new pharaoh in Egypt, one who didn't know Joseph, one who would enslave Israel. And Joseph's remains, though, would be taken out of Egypt but there's not going to be any funeral procession. In Exodus 13, 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry my bones with you from here. So the, this hope that Joseph had was in, in one sense, at least initially, fulfilled. 
And as the people of Israel received this book as, as part of the Torah, they were there on the border of the promised land. So this is after the 400 years, after the 40 years of wandering through the wilderness because of their sin, that they carried the remains of Joseph with them all the way. And they would indeed enter the land. They would indeed take the land. In Joshua 24, 32, As for the bones of Joseph, with which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem. And the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. So not even death can hinder the Lord in his sovereign plan for his people. Genesis begins with birth in Eden. It ends with a coffin in Egypt. But the end of Genesis is only the beginning. We began our studies of Genesis February of last year, over 16 months ago. Genesis is the first book in the Bible, and though, though it contains other elements, it's primarily a narrative. It's a story. But Genesis doesn't begin with once upon a time. It begins before time. Genesis lays the foundation for the Bible, as we have seen. And so it's very important that, that you understand that this is not just a fictional story, that this is reality. This is the story of God's dealings with his people. The, it's, it's important that, that you believe the Bible from Genesis 1-1 right to the end of Revelation, to, to Revelation 22. So Genesis is a story of God and his dealings with his people. It begins with God's creation of everything out of nothing in six days of the creation week. It's, and so the, the crowning glory of God's creation is, is man on the sixth day. And on the seventh day, God rested, providing a pattern for the rest of us. And man was to be an image bearer of God, reflecting his, his communicable attributes, his goodness, his love, his mercy, and, and so on. But in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17, God told man, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is referred to as the covenant of works, summarized in do this and live. Well, we know what happened next. The serpent tempted Eve and she ate and she gave to her husband and he ate. Sin entered the world through Adam, our, our federal head, and, and through him, all of humanity would be born in sin, utterly depraved. All of humanity would come under the curse. Death entered the world. Man's relationship with God was severed. But God, in his grace, took the initiative in restoring that relationship, uh, of breaking the curse and providing life. And so then God initiated the promise of the covenant, the covenant of grace in Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and your offspring. You will bruise, he shall bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Speaking to the serpent, here that the serpent is, is going to bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but, but the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. And so Genesis is the story of the seed of the woman at war with the seed of the serpent. And that war runs all the way through Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament. Genesis provides a foundation for God's covenantal dealings with his people as he makes covenants with Noah and then with Abraham, covenants that will continue into the Old Testament, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with David. And these covenants grow in wonder and in clarity, anticipating the fulfillment of the covenant of grace, the new covenant in Christ's blood. Jesus Christ is the one who crushes the serpent's heel. Head, sorry, Jesus Christ is the one who crushes the serpent's head, and he has his heel bruised in the process. So Genesis, then, is the beginning of the story of God and of his dealings with his people. Fifty chapters divided into ten toledotes. The story of God's people, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, the line of the seed of promise. God's promises to them of a land and of a people. 
By the time we get to, Genesis, to the end of Genesis, Israel is growing through Jacob's 12 sons, but they're nowhere near the number of the stars in the heavens or the sand on the seashore that were promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By the time we get to the end of Genesis, Israel does not have land holdings in Canaan, only a burial plot. And they don't even reside in Canaan. They're still in Egypt. So the end of Genesis is only the beginning. As Genesis ends, that the promise is yet unfulfilled. Israel was looking ahead in faith. And we too are to look ahead in faith. We too await our deliverance to the promised land, the heavenly promised land, a country that Joseph and Jacob and Isaac and Abraham before him sought, a, a better country, a heavenly one. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, again, we praise you for this book of Genesis. Lord, we have learned so much about who you are and about your gracious and merciful dealings with your people. Lord, we have learned that your character never changes, that you are eternally the faithful God, the sovereign God. And Lord, we praise you that you are indeed working all things according to to the counsel of your will and that you will indeed work all things for your glory and for the good of your people. We thank you, Lord, that even our sin is used for our good, for those who love you or are called according to your purpose. Even the sin of others against us is used for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. Lord, I pray that as we walk through this life, we will remember the foundation Remember, Lord, who you are for all eternity, who you have been and who you will be. And Lord, that you will help us to look to you with repentance and faith. We ask all of these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ, the only Savior. Amen.